Unless Dr. Mikelski wants to share her conversation with the whole class. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> that makes sense. Uh, there's, a, there's a sheet coming around, so if everybody would remember to sign um, <coughs> for the, uh, so we can continue to pass these up. And, uh, and there, there will be a, a, a test at the end for all the residents present, so uh, yeah. yeah, it's a required pass for uh, staying with the residents. Well, yeah. so, all right, well, uh, so I get to introduce myself. Hi, I'm, I'm um, I, um, I figured I would um, give you a, an overview of some of the work that we're doing um, and, and the, the rationale behind some of our uh, shift in our um, experimental energy to think about uh, rational, um, developing rational methods to identify cancer earlier um, and try to really attack it in the prevention stage rather than try to um, to do a lot of treatment. And so in order to do that, we need to really go um, around and try to figure out what, what risk is all about and, and why the strategy will work. So um, <coughs> I need to uh, do some disclosures. Um, you guys can read them. So I'm a founder on a, a new company. I have equity interest in an old company. We've got some royalties. Um, and so all of this is, is good. and. For those of you who haven't uh, been on the entrepreneurial side of uh, U of M, um, it's very different now than it was 10 years ago. It's really awesome now because they really want you to do this. So um, if you're interested in doing this, do not let um, old experiences like we had in 2007 in because it's a much different environment. So, so um, at the end of um, at, at the end of the next 45 minutes, um, what I'd like to uh, to have um, given you some basis is to, to really understand that um, cancer is, is driven by stochastic or random events that uh, result in mutations. And, and the selection of um, these events really explains the risk of prior cancers. And so I'm going to spend a fair amount of time trying to really um, outline the difference between cancer causation and cancer risk. Um, we won't spend a lot of time, but it's it's really important to understand that gene environment interactions modulate this stochastic risk, so that um, every individual and every group of individuals and every family and every species has some some genetic background that um, um, both uh, in in random events and in in directed events of what that uh, gene complement encodes, um, we will contribute to the overall risk of cancer. And, and then really the, the thing that, that I think uh, is, is something that we're only starting to recognize is that adaptive evolution has repeatedly solved the problem of how to diminish cancer risk, allowing for a large size and longevity. And so we as, as humans in a society where we grow up in a, um, really our own siloed world um, um, have, have looked at cancer for the, first, for the last um, half century and probably more as is this un uniquely human condition um, that is associated with uh, behaviors that um, we, we may or may not be able to control and where there's a lot of blame to be assigned. But if we really think about it in a more holistic um, uh, premise, we can understand that, that really cancer risk is, is a, a consequence of things that we have done that make us very successful. Um, and so we really start, need to start thinking about cancer as an unintended consequence of success rather than as a cause of things that we're doing really poorly. Um, and, and given that, I think that um, uh, it, it will be an easy uh, next step to think that uh, understanding risk by creating rational risk assessment with targeted prevention provide a novel strategy to manage um, cancer risk. Um, and, and critically, uh, in, in the case of our dogs, for sure, and potentially in the case of people, that, um, that we need to understand that this risk is associated with breaking the evolutionary barrier of longevity, or what uh, we are now affectionately calling the, the pedo barrier of, of uh, life, the pedo lifespan barrier. Um, and, and so this becomes a really, really uh, important point that I hope to get across. And the, the number of slides that I have is very ambitious. We may not be able to get through all of them, but hopefully I'll get through enough to really make this, this point um, come through. So, okay. 
So um, there's there's six points or six parts to the to the talk. Um, like I said, I don't know that I'll get through everything, but spend a little bit of time talking about foundations of cancer. Um, this this idea of Peto's paradox, and if you guys don't know who Peto is or what his paradox is, don't worry, I'll tell you more about it. Um, talking about the difference between causation and risk and how they're related. Um, talking about um, our, our more recent understanding of cancer protective mechanisms across the evolutionary spectrum and defining what we call PETA's um, um, barrier and lifespan. Um, and then using bone cancer in dogs um, to, to really create a solution to this paradox, really understand um, what we were missing or what PETA was missing when we came up with, with this idea of it doesn't make sense. Um, and if we, if we have time, I'll tell you a little bit of the, about the work that we're doing now to develop rational risk assessment and targeted prevention to manage risk using the managers or and or in dogs as the um, platforms. So, so what is cancer? Cancer is a pathological condition that's characterized by uncontrolled um, cellular proliferation. Um, and, and cancer really uh, is, describes uh, hundreds of different diseases. Um, and, and collectively, all of these diseases are, are a disease of genes. So I, I channel my inner uh, Peter Noel, having trained with him, to say that, that cancer is a genetic disease, but it's not necessarily parent. Um, and, and that a complement of, of genotypic mutations, um, virtually all of these are somatic, uh, occur that initiate and sustain the cancer genome. So, in, in the wild type stage, uh, we have a risk of X, and uh, as we age, we acquire mutations through a variety of mechanisms, and those mutations modulate the risk and can drive cancer. And so um, th this is really foundational and fundamental. This, this is something that, that is it's very clear now, and you really need to understand this to figure out um, cancer symptoms. So um, at, the, at the turn of the previous century, late 1800s and 1900s, um, Bovary was working with genetics uh, and with uh, nematodes and all sorts of, of um, what, what we call lower organisms, um, studying cell division and, and chromosomes. Um, and, and back in like 1902, he actually um, hypothesized in one of his papers that um, cell division, repeated cell division, created cancer risk. And what he observed was that repeated cell division would um, result in, in missorting of chromosomes, and that those cells with missorted chromosomes could actually acquire uh, properties that, that resemble things that we saw in cancer. So, so this goes back, you know, uh, a really long time. Um, and in the 1970s, um, Sir Richard Pio, um, studying cancer, um, sort of went back to some of those observations. Um, and um, what, what he was working on was uh, he was looking at the statistics between this, this appearance of lung cancer, which really was an, a relatively unknown disease until the 1940s. It was something that didn't happen until about the 1940s. And, and then there was this explosion in lung cancer. And so um, Pito and Dahl um, spent a lot of time trying to figure out what other things happened in that interim that might uh, be responsible for this massive and unexpected increase in lung cancer, and they uncovered the association between tobacco use and cancer. <clears throat> but in his musings, um, and looking back at the work of, of Bovary and many others, um, Pito said there's, there's something that doesn't make sense. So if cancer risk is associated with cell division, so more cell divisions means more cancer risk, um, how do we get giant animals? How do we get elephants and giraffes and whales that don't all have cancer? And so he said, if I, if I look at the number of cells and the number of cell divisions, there should be a, a linear association between, or, or at least a log association between large size and cell division, and, and I don't see it. So, so his paradox, um, you know, looking at uh, elephants, and I think there was supposed to be a giraffe in this, in this background, and uh, I acknowledge Getty Images for letting me use this for 30 days for free. Um, and there's the elephant, there's the giraffe in the background. So, you know, Pito is looking at all of these things as a, as a good Englishman in the mid last century, um, you know, looking at all their colonial possessions and the wonderful <laughs> things that they own. And he says, um, at the species level, the incidence of cancer does not appear to correlate with the number of cells in an organism. Or asking the question is, why aren't bigger animals that have more cells more vulnerable to cancer? So, so this really is, is something that 
um, Pito continues to think about, and there's really no solution. Um, so to solve this, we really need to go back to think about cancer cost versus cancer risk. And so the, the colloquial um, statement is that smoking causes cancer, benzene causes cancer, you know, whatever causes cancer. And the answer is none of those things cause cancer. Mutations cause cancer. And any other behavior that uh, increases the rate of mutation or the frequency of mutation uh, modulates the risk of cancer. So if you're a smoker, you have a much greater risk of developing cancer. And the smoking is causing mutations that then can lead to cancer. But that's, that connection is not um, trivial. It's, it's quite important. Uh, and of course, this doesn't mean that I favor, uh, you know, making smoking more accessible or that I think smoking is good because if you're a smoker, you're going to die of some horrible tobacco-associated disease. But nonetheless, we have to be really careful when we say, you know, smoking causes cancer. It's mutations that cause cancer. And so anything that causes mutations modifies cancer risk. And I think in our, in our perception, we start thinking about mutation being associated with environmental mutations, right? So it's all the crap that we're putting in the environment that causes mutations. Um, and, and the answer is much more complicated than that. So the next thing that we have to think about is that cancer is not a peculiarly human disease. So there's this, this really um, um, interesting paper. It's a, it's a terrible paper to read because it's really sort of like a list of things and it's really boring. But it's actually a very useful catalog. So, so the title is From Humans to Hydra. I would actually argue that it should be titled from hydra to humans, but um, you know, patterns of cancer across the tree of life, and they basically dissect, like you know, ev every phyla of, of multicellular organisms, and they document the fact that cancer happens across the spectrum of um, multicellular animals as well as um, plants. And um, the reason that that cancer only happens in multicellular animals is because cancer in a unicellular population is a good thing. So if you're a yeast and you divide out, out of control, you're making a lot of babies and you're making really good beer or really good bread. Uh, and that's not cancer. So, so cancer really only becomes apparent when you have multicellularity and specialization of cells into um, specific functions. So, um, so when did cancer become a thing? So there's ample evidence of cancer in the fossil record. And those of a certain age will, will recognize that this is the real reason why dinosaurs became extinct. So uh, Gary Larson. Um, but um, again, if we go back uh, and we look at the fossil record, th there are a few papers that um, sort of catalog cancers and dinosaurs. And of course, the cancers that we can identify in, in dinosaur fossils tend to be preserved from bone because that's the easiest thing to do. But there are now some actual um, soft tissue uh, um, uh, structures that uh, indicate that dinosaurs also got soft tissue tumors. Um, and doing some fancy math, uh, one group estimated that uh, the, the, the rate of cancer in dinosaurs might actually be similar to the estimate of cancer rates in modern birds, given a, a, a one or a two or a five percent um, in, the, in the population. And, and that's, that's a big risk, right? The, the standard error in that would be huge, but the point is that um, we, we see uh, evidence of cancer in dinosaurs. There's a recent paper about a, a a 200 million year old turtle fossil that had osteosarcoma. So this thing has been around for a really long time. Um, but cancer really didn't become a major cause of death in humans until the 20th century. And so the, the question is, is why? Uh, and then the other, the other curious observation is the only other species where cancer proclaims a large fraction of lives are domestic dogs and domestic cats. Um, and to the extent that people keep pet mice um, um, and those mice can live to a, a bright old age um, at once. But really, um, you know, cancer is a thing in humans, it's a thing in domestic dogs and domestic cats. So um, why is that? Is it because we're sharing the same environment or is there something else? So um, when we go back to our mission and we think about the things that we're supposed to be doing, um, we, we can ask the question whether canine cancers are equivalent to human cancer. So we have this, this um, two species that um, uh, have high morbidity and mortality because of cancer, uh, and we ask, you know, are, are we seeing the same cancers? And so the overall lifetime risk of cancer that's estimated is, is similar. So in humans, we have really good actuarial data, we have really good survey data, uh, surveillance. In, in dogs, uh, not so much, so it's, you know, these are big guesses, but um, people have, have uh, come up with a, an estimate of a, a 
an overall lifetime risk of cancer in, in humans, at least in the US, of about one in three, and kind of the same in dogs, maybe a little lower in cats. Um, but importantly, the incidence of specific cancer types is very different. So some of this can be explained by exposures. Dogs, cats don't smoke. Um, they don't go into tanning beds, and if they did, um, they have hair that protects their, their skin. Um, so, you know, you start thinking about uh, cancers that are associated with tobacco use, cancer that are, cancers that are associated with sun exposure are, are likely going to be much less frequent in dogs and cats, and that's what we see. But there's other things that um, have similar frequency. So, so if we look at the population of females and humans and females and dogs, and you eliminate the, the uh, practice of Spain, um, the, the overall lifetime risk of developing mammary cancer in dogs or breast cancer in humans, again, is, is very similar, although the actual tumors that develop are not histologically comparable. Um, by and large, the frequency is not comparable. So, so are, these, are these cancers that, that have similar phenotypes in natural histories in terms of their biological behavior really equivalent? Then this is a, a complicated um, figure, and I'll walk you through it, but the answer is, is not really. So, um, we took data for four um, tumors where we have done um, uh, next generation sequencing in dogs and humans, and so we have comparable um, data from mutations in the exome. So this is in the in the coding in the in the part of the DNA that codes for genes, right? So it represents about one percent of the DNA, and so um, this is an overlapping Venn diagram of. Uh, diffuse large B cell lymphoma, osteosarcoma, melanoma, and angiosarcoma in humans, and the same thing in dogs. Uh, and what we've done is we've looked down the list uh, of, of genes that um, there really are not very many recurrent genes. Um, so we take like the top 50 and we say how many of those genes are repeated across multiple tumors in, in this population in humans. And the answer is when you look, for example, at lymphoma, there's very little overlap with any other disease. Um, there's an overlap here that is shared between lymphoma and melanoma, and there's an overlap here that's shared between lymphoma, diffuse large B cell lymphoma, osteosarcoma, and melanoma. Um, but then when you look at, at osteo, it has some overlap with melanoma, some overlap with angio. Uh, melanoma and angio have a little bit of overlap. So, so there are some genes in common between this, and, and by and large, all of the genes that are shared tend to be things that control DNA integrity or cell proliferation. So, as you would expect, right? Those, those are things that really modulate risk and progression. When you look across dogs, so diffuse RHB cell lymphoma, melanoma, uh, hemangiosarcoma, um, hemangiosarcoma and fish, so we just shorten it, osteosarcoma. There's only one gene that's shared between um, hemangiosarcoma, melanoma, and osteosarcoma. And if anybody had to guess, that gene would be prototypical cancer gene. K huh? K rats? Uh, no, it's actually a tumor suppressor. Yeah, P53. So so the only the only thing that's shared is is that P53 is is a, a gene ID that's shared and and it's it's only recurrent because the gene is inactivated but the actual mutations in P53 are not shared within tumors or across tumors. The, the mutations of P53 can occur basically anywhere where it inactivates its function. Um, and then if we, so if we look across tumors and we look at how many genes are shared in the top list between human um, angiosarcoma and canine angiosarcoma, there's only one. Between human melanoma and canine melanoma, there's only one. Between human diffuse RHB cell lymphoma and canine diffuse RHB cell lymphoma, there are none. And so even though these diseases are very, very similar at the morphology, the uh, uh, location, the histology, the biological behavior, none of the gene IDs that come across are shared. Um, there's five in osteosarcoma, but that's really because there's no recurrence. So you have these lists that, that are really long, and there's just kind of one. And are these from freshly dissected tumors, or are these from like cell lines? From no, uh, all these data come from actual whole tumors. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah, so these, these are not cell lines, or we would have selected for a specific exactly. yeah. Um You know, and the numbers, um, for, for humans, the, the numbers tend to be larger. But for example, for osteo, we actually have data on um, um, just, just under 100 dogs. So for, for angio, we have data on about, um, uh, I think, 48. Um, uh, for melanoma, this is the paper out of TGen. 
and they had uh, you know a reasonable sample size. So these are not things in the three or four. I mean, these these things are supported. Um, for the few such cell on I think we had um, um, forty some, and then we've been able to actually add data from RNA seq and look for um, uh, valid recurrent mutations, expand in the population, how many are present, and then <coughs> look for targeted things. So, so the numbers are actually pretty good. Um, and so if we go back and we start thinking about um, the, the really seminal work from Kumasetti and Vogel's team, thinking about um, what really causes mutations, um, they, they, they did some fascinating work where they basically said that the number of cell divisions in a stem cell population uh, is proportional to the cancer risk in that particular organ, with, with some notable exceptions. Um, and those exceptions are driven by behaviors. So if you, um, what, what they basically did is they divided cancer risk into three broad groups um, called hereditary, replicative, and environmental. And so if we start with environmental, these are things that we know. So um, cancer of the lung, cancer of the um, oral cavity, head and neck, um, the, the digestive tract, um, bladder are, are strongly associated with certain and, and uh, 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 melanoma and non-melanoma skin cancers are, are strongly associated with, with environmental exposures and behaviors. And so if they look across all of the cancers, these, these account for somewhere around 30% of the risk, the overall risk of, in humans. So their range is 25 to 40, it's about 30. Um, if we just look at, at replication, the number of cell divisions that we go, which really means the number of stem cells, how many times they divide, and then aging, this accounts for up to 70%, about, about two-thirds of, of the disease um, in humans, with bone cancer being the poster child for a stochastic, replicated, induced uh, risk tumor. And then uh, hereditary cancers really represent a very small fraction and, and virtually <coughs> all associated with syndromes where there are families that have a particular mutation in a gene and that um, that mutation increases the risk of cancer um, by a hundredfold or more, or more in that particular individual or family, but they're not widely dispersed across the population. So, so they account for about 5% of the risk. Um, and so if we think about, about this in, in dogs, um, you know, this becomes a much lower proportion. And so I think it's fair to say that when we think about dogs, we're really going to be representing you know, 90% of the population here, uh, maybe 99% of the population here with some contribution from heritability that we don't totally understand, but seems to be widespread and very lowly penetrant and quite complex. So um, if we go back to Peter's paradox, it, it's fair to say that, you know, more animals, more cell divisions, uh, longer life should be associated with, with more cancer. So why are we not seeing that? How do we get 80-year-old elephants and you know 120-year-old parrots and 200-year-old whales that are not all dying of cancer. Um, and, and so there's this, this really nice uh, data set where people are looking at um, um, how are there are there relationships between this this body mass and lifespan and, and how do you actually select an evolution for an animal that has to expend a lot of energy getting really 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 big. Um, and really the only way that makes sense is, is if, if over the course of selection that animal can utilize that energy expenditure over a long lifespan. And so, you know, what, what is 70 years for us is two years for a mouse, um, but it's, um, you know, maybe 90 years for an elephant. And how, how do we actually figure out what, what those realities are? Um, and then we go to dogs, and, and dogs are completely opposite, right? We all joke that, uh, um, great days are puppies until they're four and then they die when they're five, you know. And then um, the longest of chihuahuas are the meanest chihuahuas, so we, we all know that, right? But the, the generally speaking, um, the uh, relationship between body mass and lifespan is inverse. So, so what's going on? Why don't dogs fit this scheme? And so there was this really nice paper published in uh, Nature Reduced Cancer in um, 2018. Um, looking at mechanisms of, uh, of cancer resistance in long lived mammals. So, what Selenov and his colleagues did is they really assembled data from a lot of different places and they asked um, what's going on, wh why do these animals get to live longer? And so, this is our interpretation of the data. And so, we've taken a number of long lived species, um, um, not all of which are big, um, and then we've taken um, humans, dogs, mice, and cats. 
And we've plotted the estimated lifespan of that species in years in blue against uh, estimated evolutionary divergence of that species in red. So when, when did that species evolve from its most recent common ancestor? Um, and so the Galapagos turtle, for example, is estimated to live about 200 years. So this is the scale up here. So Galapagos turtles live about 200 years. Uh, Amazon parrots, um, about the same. Bowhead whales, uh, about the same. And all of these have estimates from, from reasonably good records, although um, not very many specimens. Um, more specimens for turtles or parrots than for whales. For uh, Minky whales are uh, estimated to live about 50 years. Elephants, about 70 years is an average between African and Asian. African mole rats, about 30 years. Um, the lifespan of a, a feral cat um, is estimated to be only about two years. So cats that uh, are roaming, you know, um, uh, feral communities, be they in, in U.S., in Europe, in Asia, and Africa, uh, don't have really long lifespans. Um, wild mice have, have tiny lifespans, right? They're, they're born and they're eaten by a hawk. Um, feral dogs um, have an estimated lifespan of, of less than four years, which is not that different from uh, wolves in wilderness. Uh, um, wolves in unprotected areas have a much shorter lifespan due to human uh, influence. And then ancestral humans, if you look at modern hunter-gatherers or if you look at ancestral humans, it, it seems like our species um, really was adapted to live about you know, 30 to 40 years. And so all of these things evolved over a period of, of millions of years. So the turtles, uh, the Galapagos turtles um, split off from the turtle main stem about 7 million years ago. Parrots about 50, uh, whales about 15, elephants about 25, mole rats about 40 million years ago, cats about 6 million years ago, and so on. Um, and then when you compare modern humans, dogs, um, mice, and cats, what we see is that we've actually doubled or tripled or quadrupled the lifespan in, in the modern population versus the ancestral population. So in humans, we go from about 35 or 40 to 80. In dogs, we go from you know two to four to uh, ten, eleven, twelve. In in mice, we go from you know essentially three months to two years. In cats, we go from um, two years to fifteen years or longer. And I think all of us have, have said you know cats cats were meant to live twenty years, but their kidneys were only meant to live ten. Um, and and so that's that's true. Cats kidneys were really only supposed to last two years, right? It was only the outlier that would live five or six. So when we actually are getting cats to live 20 years because we vaccinate them and we feed them and we keep them inside and they don't get horrible diseases, um, their, their kidneys don't last. And, and the reason for that is that now instead of having millions of years to adapt into this new niche where the lifespan is X, um, we're, we're asking um, these species to adapt over a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction of time. So we domesticated cats 6,000 years ago and in that timeline, really in the last 100 years, but in 6,000 years, we um, took their lifespan from two years to 15 years. Um, we domesticated dogs 15,000 years ago, and again, really in the last 100 years, but if you want to say 15,000 years, um, we doubled or tripled their lifespan. Um, modern humans are 25,000 years ago, and we've doubled our lifespan. And so this, this really creates an opportunity um, to, to understand what's going on, we all of these species adapted to a particular lifespan that had to do with energy consumption, uh, availability of, of resources in the niche, um, reproductive age, raising young to maturity to the next generation. Um, and so, so there's a lot of really complex interactions that um, fit into the adaptive selection for a particular lifespan. Um, and, and one of those um, traits is cancer resistance. So, so the, the ability of the species to acquire mechanisms that protect you from cancer, uh, not only to reproductive age, but actually beyond reproductive age so that you can see the next generation in, are actually quite powerful and they're quite complex. Um, but when we, when we actually increase that lifespan artificially without having to measure it time to provide selection, we essentially overcome that cancer protective mechanism. And so if you think about it, uh, we don't see many cats that are two or three years old that get cancer. It's a very small fraction of the population. We don't see very many dogs that are under three that get cancer. It's a very small fraction of the population. And so the, the same frequency of, of children that develop cancer, which is about 5%, is what we would see in dogs that are under three, cats that are under four, and mice that are under three months. So, so the level of cancer protective mechanisms to that evolutionary 
um, selected age is really working. And it's only when we exceed that age that we start seeing this increase in cancer. And I don't have the, the, the figure here, but if you plot cancer rate in dogs, it basically is flat, 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 flat at you know, between one and 7% until you hit six, you know, five or six. <coughs> and then it takes this, this huge jump and it gets to 30% by the age of 10. And then it starts dropping because animals are dying of, of other reasons. So, so there's this real um, connection that, that, that we can make, or at least it, it's a really good hypothesis generating um, data set that says there's, there's a connection between evolutionary selection and cancer protective mechanisms. So when we look at estimated cancer risk, modern, 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 modern are all high. Uh, all these other guys are low. And to the extent that we can see the major cause of mortality, you know, again, Ancestral humans, cancer is not a thing. Feral dogs, cancer is not a thing. Wild mice, cancer is definitely not a thing. Feral cats, cancer is not a thing. All of these other animals, cancer is not a thing, even though they get cancer. Cancer ends up being a, a single digit cost of mortality, unlike moderns where it's cancer, 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 and kids. Um, and so um, what are the cancer protective mechanisms that we know exist? So um, we know in, in most mammals, um, perhaps in most higher vertebrates, um, their telomere attrition is, is a strongly protective mechanism. It seems to be absent in mice. And, and so in that nature of use cancer paper, there's a really funny line that says, if you're gonna be eaten by an owl, you don't really care if your telomeres are long. And so there's no drive for, for telomere attrition in mice. And it's been one of the things that, for people who study telomerase, it's really annoying because mice, mice have this really, really long telomeres that don't sh shrink, unlike uh, dogs and humans and others. Um, so um, then we go into these other species that have been much more uh, studied, and we know that African mole rats, the different species of African mole rats have developed different mechanism, mechanisms of stromal environment modifications. And so, you know, a cover of nature, a cover of science, looking at uh, hyaluronic acid and other aspects of the microenvironment that, that seem to be strongly protective for African mole rats in terms of cancer development. Um, the story of elephants with um, expansion of, of P53, which is really fascinating and going back and seeing that this happened um, um, after the, the elephant split into the, the lineage that includes mammoths and mastodons. So all those guys have more copies of P53, um, but the other relatives of the elephants like manatees and uh, hyraxes and stuff don't. Uh, minke whales um, have some, some really fascinating uh, changes in, in the <coughs> methylation of their genome. Uh, and then multiple mechanisms of metabolic alterations that really, um, by our understanding, slow down aging. So that um, the, the aging of a bowhead whale cell or a parrot cell or a turtle cell in our chronology is much, much slower. They age one month for every year, every human year that they live, or they age you know, two months for every human year that they live. And, and it really has to do with how they utilize energy and how they produce waste. And so um, it, it, it is a way to actually um, reduce the error rate or fix DNA damage that is really creating these protective mechanisms. And every single species uses a different mechanism. So um, the expansion of P53 is not unique to elephants, but the massive expansion into you know, 15 or, or 20 copies it's absolutely unique to elephants. Rats have two. There's a couple of species of bats that have, you know, two or four. Um, they don't really seem to be protective. So when we start thinking about can we do this in humans or in dogs? Can we inject more p53 into, you know, iPSC cells and make uh, genetic babies that have 20 copies of p53? The answer is probably not because the the species, the organism, is not adapted to having 20 copies of p53, and so it'll probably never develop. It'll probably just die because because the uh, the, the strength of that apoptotic signal is not consistent with you know, 40 million years of evolution. So, so what are the consequences of outperforming our evolutionarily determined life expectancy or breaking through that fetal lifespan barrier? So more cell divisions, um, more environmental exposures, more mutations, and more cancer, right? So if you live longer than your um, species was supposed to live based on your evolutionary selection, your cancer risk is going to increase. And, and now cancer becomes an, oh, of course we're going to get more cancer, right? This is, this is just what happens. Um, and so um, can we actually uh, 
create empirical evidence for this. And so bone cancer is, is a really nice example to explain this. So uh, osteosarcoma is the most common primary tumor of bone. Uh, it happens across every vertebrate, vertebrate class. So if you have bones, you get osteosarcoma. In humans, it's rare, uh, primarily in disease of children, adolescents, and young adults. In virtually every other species that we know, it's rare and tends to happen in the axial skeleton. But in dogs, it occurs in disproportionately high numbers. And so again, the question is why? So um, in, in kids, there is uh, a risk. It's not huge, but there's a measurable risk that's associated with, with being bigger. Bigger at birth, growing faster, um, your risk increases by a statistically significant fraction, although it's still a fairly small. It's, it's a rare disease, and it increases relatively small. Um, in dogs, we definitely see that there's an association with um, both height and body mass. So, the bigger you are, the more likely you are to get bone cancer. And so more cell divisions in a bone equals more risk of cancer, more risk of mutations. Um, and genome-wide association studies that, that we have done, at least in three species, have not really pinpointed strong genetic factors, um, either in humans or in dogs. So, so there are things that you can find and you can point to. Yeah. If, if uh, more cellular divisions equals more risk, if dogs or children are breaking more bones, is that increasing the risk as well? Um, so, so um, yes, um, but a qualified yes. So um, uh, it depends on where the break happens, mm -hmm. and it depends on what the consequence of that break is. So for example, if you break a bone uh, in the mid shaft, um, and the repair is mostly by fibrosis, mm -hmm. um, there, there's really not a lot more osteoloss proliferation. Um, the, the process of, of bone repair is quite different. Um, if you break a bone in the growth plane and repair induces more proliferation, the answer is probably yes. Um, if that growth plate fuses and, and is replaced by fiber cartilage, the answer is no. And so there, there are actually very conflicting data. There's some studies that look at um, fractures and implants that are used for fracture repair in bone. Uh, and, and if you look at some analysis of those data, the answer is there's an association between implants right. and fracture repair in dogs. And then there's other papers that take the same data, and their conclusion is that there is none. And so I think that um, one of the things to be really cautious about is to think that um, no study should be definitive, and you should really try to understand how they apply statistics, because misapplication of statistics is rampant, uh, as uh, um, Mike could attest to it's one of his. <laughs> Um, so again, we go back to, you know, why aren't elephants riddled with bone cancer since they have huge bones? And, and the answer is evolution, right? Because they really have evolved in an adaptive way into that niche to be able to get to that size. So, so natural selection increases the probability that beneficial traits are passed on to the next generation. Cancer protective mechanisms allow for successful competition in niches that accommodate animals with large body size. And so Peter's paradox is the result of superimposing adaptive evolution natural selection on populations. Um, and so when we look at dogs, um, dogs are, are, you know, if you look at dogs, Peter's paradox doesn't exist. Now we have bigger animals with bigger bones developing more bone cancer. And that's exactly what we would predict. And so in addition to that, we've removed natural selection and we've replaced that with artificial selection. So we have, uh, you know, the, the uh, ancestral dog that maybe looks something like, like this. Um, or, or perhaps even something like this. Um, and we've, we've shrunken that guy down with a couple of genes that control for size, and we've moved that in this direction with a few genes that control for size. And those genes are not necessarily the, the, the things that promote risk. It's the fact that they promote more cell division to get to that large size. So 20,000 years of artificial selection with emphasis on size hasn't allowed these dogs to develop any cancer protective mechanisms to compensate for the massive increase in size. And, and really, the genomic plasticity that allows us to achieve this genetic variation has not been exploited to the same extent in any other animals. So if we made elephants that instead of being you know, seven tons and 12 feet high were eight times as big, and we increased their lifespan from 80 years to 200 years, we probably would see 50% mortality from bone cancer. It's a hard experiment to do. I'm not sure how easy it would be to get it through either. Um, but, um, yeah. So, um, you know, and again, if you look at the mechanisms of mutation, this is something that I showed you before. But now what we're looking at is looking at the context of mutations 
and the mechanisms that drive mutation in bone cancer of humans and dogs. And so these are what we call the cosmic signatures. You look at the actual base that's mutated and you look at the context around those bases to find out what the mechanisms are. And there's multiple signatures that are defined. And, and what you can see from these Venn diagrams is that the colors don't match. And we have them tabulated here. And so 30% of um, mutations in dog bone cancer are associated with uh, endogenous mutations uh, initiated by spontaneous deamination de of 5-methylcysteines that are associated with aging. So in dogs, it's 30%. In humans, it's much lower. Um, you know, this is, this is about the same, but then we do actually have some um, signatures from soaking, predominantly in older humans. We have the effect of DNA mismatch repair in humans. Um, we have um, <coughs> Cosmic 12, which is uh, not really known. It's a signature, but we don't really know what causes it. Um, cosmic 17, again, uh, it's a, a very characteristic signature. We don't have a cause, but these are important in humans. This one, I'm sorry, in dogs, this is important in humans. So there's a, a real mismatch between um, what's happening in dogs and in humans. And the really interesting one is, I'm not sure why people are letting their dogs chew tobacco. Yeah. Yeah, it's just fun. But obviously, this is, this is a, a chewing tobacco associated uh, signature and aflatoxin, but there's other mechanisms that actually account for this. So, so um, this mechanism is probably not because dogs are, you know, carrying skull in their back pocket. Um, and, and again, this this just goes back to the random patterns. You know, we have p53 in in, in dogs. About 50% of the tumors have a mutation in p53. About uh, uh, 10 or 15% have a mutation in p53 in humans. But you have to go really, really far down the list to get those other comparable mutations. It's really, really random and stochastic. So um, primary or secondary mutations can be species-specific events, or their abundance is really different. Uh, the conglomerate of events uh, will affect the environment and, and heritable factors for the individual, and the functional phenotypes um, become convergent. So this is really important. The reason that we actually see a diffuse large B-cell lymphoma under the microscope in a dog or in a human, or we look at the biological behavior and we can't tell them apart very easily, is because the, the conglomerate events that actually lead to that disease converge into a phenotype. And that phenotype is what we call diffuse large B cell lymphoma or osteosarcoma or angiosarcoma. So there's, there's many, many roads that lead to Rome. And whatever road you, you take, <coughs> you eventually end up in Rome. And Rome is that phenotype of the disease. So if you think about it in that perspective, it's not surprising that lymphoma looks like lymphoma and behaves like lymphoma because you've actually selected for that particular phenotype of a cell that grows out of the germinal center of the lymph node uh, and has certain properties and characteristics. And it's not because both of them have mutations in ECH, it's because they both converge into transcriptional programs. Um, so, and this is, this is nicely illustrated in, in um, transcriptional programs in Oscar sarcoma, and I won't get into that. Um, because we don't have a lot of time. So if, if cancer really is inevitable because we are living longer, and this is a really good thing, I, I think that very few people would actually say, kill me off in 40 so I don't get cancer, then you know, um, what, what is the right solution? So one solution is to actually develop cures for advanced cancers, which is really, 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 really hard. Another solution is to um, do risk assessment by identifying early changes in transformation and creation of the niche. And repeatedly, this has been actually um, shown to be effective in, in humans. So the, the biggest reasons for the downshift in the curve of cancer mortality have been by screening um, prevention by changing behaviors and early detection with interventions, right? So, so most of it is related to smoking <coughs> cessation, um, colonoscopy and, and removal of any suspicious lesions and, and, and vigilance and surveillance. Um, and then um, in, in women, uh, uh, imaging, including mammography and other mechanisms that allow uh, early interventions. The problem with that is that there's really high morbidity, right? So if you're a woman and you have to go get a pap smear or, or a mammogram, that's not the happiest day of the month or the year. Or the year. Um, and the interventions are not fun. Um, so we, we need to figure out ways to actually make the, the diagnostics easier and the interventions less uh, harsh. And so there are many mechanisms that are being used, like uh, looking in, in blood for uh, recurrent mutations in cell-free DNA, uh, exosomal contents, circulating tumor cells, uh, and we're trying to apply all of these. But th the important thing is that if you find evidence for early cancer or higher risk, 
it, it has to be action. Otherwise, um, you, you tell your patient or you tell your patient's owner, you know, the, the, the individual is at great risk for cancer, she is gonna die, he is gonna die, but we don't know where or when or how, but you know, go have a nice day. Well, that, that's not what you want people walking out of the hospital to think. So if we're gonna develop these tests, they really have to be actionable. And so um, the actionable can be by developing immunotherapies that attack cells carrying driver mutations that are very, very specific. Um, they're not free of risk, but they might be one opportunity um, targeted therapies that attack tumor propagating cells or targeted therapies that disrupt the tumor niche. And, and we, uh, by, by absolute random fortune, fell into a drug that, that does both of these. Um, and so we had a test that we hadn't really been able to deploy looking at an association between tumor-associated or endothelial-like progenitors with hemangiosarcoma. So this was published uh, you know, over a decade ago. And basically this shows that there's few of these events in blood from healthy dogs high in the sarcoma that goes away if you treat. Uh, and this is work that Taylor's been doing for the last three years in the lab, trying to replicate these data. Um, and so this is what she does. She takes uh, blood samples from dogs. She lyses the red cells, gets rid of the platelets, um, keeps the white blood cells, and then um, does some analysis to look for these cells. Um, and basically what we have here is, is data showing the gating that she does with flow cytometry. So we're essentially trying to get rare events that don't represent white blood cells that are associated with risk. Um, and what she finds is that um, if we spike these cells with hemangiosarcoma, if we spike blood with hemangiosarcoma cells, we can come up with, with a limit of detection. So if we have about one, somewhere between one and five um, cells per microliter of blood, <laughs> we can actually find them using this test very artificially. But the thing that we find when we go to real data is that the cells that, that go here, which would be the hemangiosarcoma circulating cells, are, are actually quite rare in, in our dog population. But we see this population here, and this population here has, has multiple phenotypes. Um, and so what we have done working with Ali is that we have taken a multiple, um, multiple parameters that we get out of our test, and I won't go through them. Um, and he integrates these parameters using artificial intelligence. And the, the initial work was done with five parameters. We're increasing that to, uh, to 11. Um, and basically, if you look uh, sort of at unbiased data, um, you can see here the red, the red dots represent dogs with hemangiosarcoma, and they sort of form a universe that is a little bit different from the other guys. And so this tells us that, that the data are trainable, that, that there's going to be a subset of dogs with hemangiosarcoma that we should be able to detect and that if we train the data, we'll be able to develop algorithms that give us a diagnosis. And so this is the magic of LA. So the magic of LA is that we can take about 100 samples of dogs that have hemangiosarcoma, are otherwise perfectly healthy and we can't recognize any disease, they have another cancer, or they have a vascular pathology in the spleen, and using that uh, training and cross-validation, Ali can basically generate these four groups with some level of uncertainty, but tremendous sarcoma separates um, really nicely. And uh, working with, with Kelly and exosomes in dogs with lost sarcoma, he's been able to essentially recapitulate the same to create a separation between osteosarcoma, uh, a couple of other cases that had bone cancer or cancer of bone that was not osteosarcoma healthy dogs and then dogs with a variety of other diseases. So, so we have these, these nascent or potential diagnostics. And so, um, you know, what is the classification accuracy? It's actually pretty good. So when we use artificial intelligence, our classification accuracy is in the rate of about 80%. Um, and so what we can say is that we, we expect that um, about 70% of the dogs are going to um, have a signet, 70% of dogs with hemangiosarcoma are gonna have a signature that we can detect. And we can probably find about 90% of those dogs with this test. So 30% so of the dogs with hemangiosarcoma we may miss because they don't have the right signature. And 10% of the dogs with hemangiosarcoma may, may be misclassified given the training that we can do. Hopefully we can get that better. Um, but the good thing is that so far, we don't seem to be putting normals into our risk category. So, if the, so, so we don't really have any false positives, which is, which is really good. You don't want to tell someone that their healthy dog is going to die of some horrible thing. Um, and if you look at a population of, of healthy dogs over six, so we now have 91 presumably healthy dogs, um, all of them in duplicate, uh, 99 dogs with a definitive diagnosis, and you look at what's, what's happening. If you look at, at um, this 
um, this row over here, uh, about 8% of the dogs seem to, uh, their, their characteristics tell us that their uh, signature would belong into the group of commander sarcoma. About 50% would be healthy. Uh, about 25% would be splenic non neoplastic and about 22 uh, might be running around with incipient other cancer. And, and these data are continuing to get refined. So uh, initially we had about uh, 10, 50, 30, and, and 10. So these two groups seem to split a little more and we'll see where the data end up. And if we actually look at the follow-up, it's really interesting. So we have tested 160 dogs in China on phase three. 120 dogs have, um, were tested six months ago or more. 80 dogs were tested over a year ago. And when we look at the dogs, for, and, and, and our follow-up is actually 100%. So owners have been returning their surveys like clockwork for 100% of the dogs. So we have follow-up for all of these dogs. And six out of these 120 dogs that we have followed for six months or 80 that we have followed for one year, uh, developed hematosarcoma. Uh, and eight dogs were diagnosed with other tumors. So the numbers are really, really consistent. And, and what, we're, what we're in the process of doing for the 200 dogs that will come in China, it's actually matching what was our prediction, how long did it take, and what disease it became. Um, and, and I guarantee you it will not be perfect. It, it will not be perfect, but I'm thinking it's actually going to be quite good. So if we can do this, now what, what do we do? And this is where EVAP comes in, and I know there's, most of you are familiar with EVAP, some of you are not, so EVAP is a drug that consists of epidermal growth factor and neurokinase linked to um, uh, 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 genetically engineered pseudomonas exotoxin, so uh, EGF and neurokinase are linked in tandem uh, with the exotoxin <coughs> being at the end, and so these essentially serve as baits to bind to epidermal growth factor your kinase receptor and deliver the toxin to cells. Um, we've tested this in dogs and the risk from acute and chronic side effects is extremely low, so we feel confident that we can give it to healthy dogs. Um, it targets uh, initiating cells in the hemangiosarcoma population, potentially osteosarcoma that expresses the epidermal growth factor and urokinase. Um, it, it potentially targets neoangiogenic vascular elements in the niche, and it targets the immunosuppressive inflammatory cells in the so um, it, it's, again, it's remarkably, remarkably safe, strong efficacy signal. And so we think it's an effective tool to eliminate tumor initiating cells. So, so it creates an opportunity to actually test this in prevention. And this is just the data that many of you are familiar with showing that in dogs with hematosarcoma, adding EVA to the standard of care uh, improves our outcomes. Um, and so the mechanisms of action um, seem to work best in the minimal residual disease setting. It targets tumor cells plus dermal cells in the environment to make an inhospitable niche for tumor growth um, and, and also s might eliminate macrophage uh, infiltrations that counterattacks one of the immunosuppressive checkpoints. So uh, EGFR and UPAR are expressing sarcoma stem cells, as I showed you before, and I won't walk you through the data because we're late, but it, it, it essentially this is work from Antonella and Dan Valera, it basically kills the cells that form spheres that are the same cells that initiate tumors. And if you give it to mice um, that, that have a fairly, fairly heavy tumor burden early in the uh, course of tumor growth, you can see in, in this particular group is most effective, um, the mice can essentially develop uh, no tumors. So, so we think that there's really good promise for using this in the prevention center. So um, that's where we are, and again, um, I think the, the points to leave you with are that bone cancer uh, exemplifies the nature of cancer and in the context of evolution. It's a simple and elegant solution to Peter's paradox of size and risk. Um, bone cancer, the incidence is slow and similar across vertebrate phyla, except for dogs. Um, the anatomical predilection is also similar, except in dogs and humans, meaning it goes to uh, non appendicular areas, except in dogs and humans. And size superimposed with longevity, genomic organization explains virtually all of the risk of dogs. And the concept is pretty universal, and you can apply this to environmental cancers in humans as well as everything else. So in part, uh, our dogs and us are victims of our success, uh, creating societies where we can live a long time, and the devastating impact of cancer in developed societies can be explained because of rapid gains in longevity where artificial selection has replaced natural selection. So the next generation solutions 
require uh, rationally applied and actionable methods for risk assessment with targeted prevention. So take home message again, um, somatic mutations and selection explain the risk of cancer, gene environment interactions modulate this risk. Uh, adaptive evolution has found a way to minimize this risk for a particular lifespan. And once we break that lifespan, we think that the solution is to do rational risk assessment um, and targeted prevention. So lots of people who are responsible for the work, but I definitely want to do a shout out to um, um, uh, Antonella for all the work with EGA, um, and uh, Ashley and, and Taylor and Mitzi for all the work with um, Shine On um, on our side, and um, certainly to um, the, the CIC um, listed here, uh, and especially Amber, who has been leading this, and uh, Aaron and Lauren on our bioinformatics group, and uh, all the people in pathology, and, and certainly to Ali for all the work with um, uh, artificial intelligence, and Kelly for the work on Oscar So um, these are the people who gave us. So mm -hmm. thanks for coming, and um, eat pizza. How do you think this uh, thought would change our message in your girl's journal? So I think that the, uh, there's there's two things where I have become kind of a pain in the rear for the community, and one is that um, when people are trying to sell models of disease, as you know, we we should develop lymphoma drugs and lymphoma, and we should develop bone cancer drugs and bone cancer. I, I think that it really depends on what you're trying to do as to whether that's valid or not. So if you're trying to do a targeted drug that attacks a mutation that's uh, highly prevalent in human diffuse large B cell lymphoma, the dog is not going to be a, the right model. Um, I think that one of the things that, that's completely under-recognized is that the dog is a great model to understand cancer risk in a, in a species that has acquired a certain longevity, right? So, so that we really could start to understand this uh, stochastic replicative risk in developing cancer for a species that lives two or three or four times as long as it should. Um, and that from that perspective, the, the dog and the cat are going to be incredibly useful because it, it now becomes sort of molecular epidemiology and risk assessment. Uh, and the types of cancer that develop become irrelevant because they are whatever the species is. Uh, and they're associated with their own exposures and stuff, but the mechanisms are really the same. So I think that it's a, a completely new niche that we can exploit that um, otherwise would be really hard to do because it's, it's hard to control that in mice that live in a controlled environment where you're, int you're introducing drug mutations. Um, I think to the extent that we develop cytotoxic drugs, the dog is a great model because you know, if you're killing cells, you're killing cells, and that's uh, a really good thing. Um, I think that the dog creates a really wonderful opportunity to assess whether this idea of early detection and targeted prevention within a latency period of four years is possible, right? So if we screen dogs that are five, that are going to develop cancer at 10, and we can actually identify the incipient cancer at five or at six, and we can manage it and reduce the mortality from cancer at 10, then it gives us an opportunity to think about how do we do that for humans where the latency period could be 40 years. Um, and, and so it's a really low bar. I mean, it's a, it's a really high bar, but compared to what we do in humans, it's a really low bar. So I think it's not about whether or not dogs are a, a great model or not, not a great model. I think it's a, an opportunity to really think about when they are a great model. It's the same is true for cats and mice. When they are a great model, what is the question you want to answer? And make sure that the question you want to answer is appropriate in that particular and so, um, you know, the, it, is, it is unfortunate that I'm very uh, obstinate and uh, uh, opinionated because um, I sit in a number of study sections and I get all of the dog cancer grants. And some of them are getting rejected because they say, you know, we're going to study targeted drugs for melanoma in dogs. And I can say, well, if you read the paper, you would know that the, the drug that you're trying to test is pointless to test in a dog because that mutation doesn't exist. Um, you know, it, it, you, you create other opportunities that I think are really exemplified by the work that Cheryl did on, on sea kid and mast cell tumors, right? And the, the idea is, can you use that as a model for sea kid disease 
And can you infer something about gastrointestinal stromal tumors in humans that are driven by GIST? So now we know that the mutation in 90% of dogs with bladder cancer happens to be the same mutation that humans with melanoma get. Uh, and we know that in humans with melanoma, if you treat them with uh, BRAF inhibitors, they have this wonderful response for six months and then they relapse explosively. Okay? So I think the dog creates a, a phenomenal opportunity to actually take dogs with bladder cancer, keep, treat them with RAF inhibitors, and then say, okay, so we're going to see this, this phenomenal remission. What else can we do so that they don't relapse at that point? And that, that's an incredible opportunity, right? And, and so it, if it works in dogs with bladder cancer, you have a really strong argument to test it in humans. If it doesn't work in dogs with bladder cancer, then it's probably less of a, you know, an investment opportunity. So I think it's not a question of whether it's a model. I think it's a question of always asking is this model suitable for the question we want to test? Do we say, do you say the same thing with the evolutionary, you know, or whatever you call it, with the humans and the dogs in like a horse that we've domesticated? That's a really, that's a great question and a question that we asked ourselves repeatedly and that we are asked every time that we talk about this. And so, um, to the extent that we can, that we can measure lifespan in horses, the 30-year-old horse is an outlier. Um, and so when we look at, at horses and cows and pigs and goats and sheep, we have not dramatically increased their lifespan. We haven't increased their lifespan by two or three or four times like we have in other species. And, and we don't know the reason for that. We don't know why it's harder to make a, a really old horse, to make many more horses get to that really old age. And so when you look at old horses, there is a, a slight if, if you look at the epidemiology of cancer in horses, th there is a, a trend towards going up, but then the horses die. Mm. And so if we could actually keep the horses around for 40 years, I think we would really start seeing that, that peak. And the same is true if we didn't you know, kill cows when they're not making milk, right. or when they're you know, the prime for beef and we kept them around for a really long time. Um, we would see the same things. And, and uh, anecdotally, I had a friend who tried to do that, but then the steers wanted to kill them. <laughs> so they, they had to become birders. Um, you know, and, and uh, I had a, uh, an interesting call a few years ago, this is when Mike Bertha was still alive, from a guy in Iowa who said, you know, we're seeing, jeez, uh, I don't remember the number, um, uh, 20 lymphomas in our conglomerate of slaughterhouses and pigs every day. And this is, and I'm going like 20 lymphomas every day. You know, that's like, holy. And, and uh, then I, I stopped and I said, okay, what's the denominator, right? And the denominator was 20,000. And, and so, you know, 20, 20 pigs. And, and, and so the first thing that I said to myself is like, I really have to stop eating bacon, right? 20,000 <laughs> Getting killed every day is just not cool. Yeah. But, but that is a different conversation. And, and so, so, so 20 over 20,000, you know, it's still a, a number, right? I mean, it's one in a thousand. Uh, pigs under six months of age. So it, it does create a really interesting epidemiology question to think, is it viral, is it environmental, is it just pig lymph nodes? We don't know. So so the only outcome from that was that uh, I connected him with Mike Murta, who was interested in pig immunology, and they developed uh, uh, some cell lines out of pig lymphomas that they called Mike 1 and Mike 2. So so Mike, uh, you know, sadly is no longer with us, but his legacy stays with us. Wow. Immortalized pig cell lines called Mike 1 and um, so, so I think that as we look at all of these species and we, you know, if, if you think about what we can do with, with parrots, right, I mean, they're already living three human generations. Yeah. I mean, people have to put their parrot in their will. Yeah. And so how could we actually make a parrot go from 120 years to 400 years, you know? And, and so there's something about how we have adapted our environment and our lifespan that, that fits us. And it, it fits our dogs. We've done something that fits our dogs, but it doesn't necessarily seem to fit anybody else. And maybe it's just because dogs were the first ones we domesticated. Mm -hmm. And so they've been with us longer and they've been able to adapt to that environment or we've adapted them. Um, and we've changed them also. This we have changed them. I mean, the difference between breeds and cows is, is less dramatic than the difference yeah. in breeds and in, in, in yeah. dogs. So. And, and by the way, if you feed your dog uh, grain-free food, you <laughs> shouldn't because dogs can digest starch quite effectively. Yeah. Unlike wolves. So that's one, right. one thing that we, you know, we, we selected or they selected themselves to eat garbage that had a lot of starch. <laughs>
and great for you guys. It's about hard for you to go. Yeah. So. All right. Well, thanks for thanks for coming. Right. Back. Really appreciate it. Thank you. You guys are running on you want to be in CIC? Yeah, I want to Yeah. And Manila, are you on clinic? Do you have uh, a few minutes? Or are you yeah, staying? I have a few minutes. Can you join us in CIC? Sure. I can't distract. I have a. Yeah, I think I have a few minutes. Well, no, I was uh, out on Tuesday. Oh, that's right. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Thanks for coming. Yeah.